opportunity to introduce Jonathan Smucker to our group. Um, Jonathan is with the executive director, or is the executive director of Beyond the Choir, the political organizer with Pennsylvania Stands Up, and he's also a founder of Lancaster Stands Up. So he is here to talk to us today about organizing in the populist moment. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Hey. Um, I think I'm going to use this for the recording. And does it help with amplification? OK, great. And how long should I be aiming for? OK, great. Um, so um, I just want to say uh, a little, a tiny bit about myself by way of introduction, just um, so you know a little bit more about as it relates to the work we've been doing in Lancaster and that we've been uh, doing now in New York and, and some other places in the state. Um, but I am from Lancaster County. I'm, I'm from outside of a little town called Burdenhand, if you've ever been to it. Um, I was raised Mennonite, very conservative, rural, working class, very uh, religious. Um, so I'm not really the usual suspect of the kind of person who would then spend um, the past two plus decades of my life kind of in um, uh, social movements that are um, like Occupy Wall Street and the Global Justice Movement and um, working for organizations like Move On and other organizations that I've worked for. Um, and I say that because um, people, you know, I, I lived for about two decades in bigger cities and people uh, in progressive circles would always, when they found out my background, they'd be like, how did you become progressive or how did you become an activist? Um, and I just always thought it was kind of, a series of random accidents that happened while I was in high school, you know? And that could have happened to anyone. And that, that always sat with me because as I started studying um, uh, sociology and American history later, um, realizing that areas like the middle of the state, areas between, you know, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, that over the past 50 years, um, there have been less and less opportunities for people from, you know, my background to have that kind of series of accidents that lead us into um, progressive politics. And um, so that that's some of what I have studied and what my work, my political work has revolved around for the past uh, 15 years has been looking at this question of, um, well, how the American left has become so insular over the past four or five decades, how we have become more talking to ourselves, and how we can break out of that. Um, and there's a lot of good reason to believe that there is a breaking out of that that is starting to happen. It's the silver lining of, of Trump's disastrous election, is that it's gotten a lot of everyday working people back into politics, but we still have to figure out how to go further. Um, and how to take back a lot of these areas of the country where progressives used to have more of a foothold uh, in some of these areas in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so that's a little bit more about me um, and what brings me to this work and some of my motivation. Um, I moved back, my wife and I moved back uh, in January of 2016 in order to organize here, but we still were just organizing with national stuff for the first half of the year. I was running Beyond the Choir, and we helped to start Common Defense, which is the veterans who have been speaking out against Trump. Um, and my wife was working for 350.org. Um, and then the election happened, and we called for an emergency community meeting, and Lancaster Stands Up was launched out of that. So <laughs> Alyssa asked me to kind of share a little bit from our experiences in Lancaster, because um, there's there's some uh, uh, there's some standout things in terms of what we've been able to do there that um, that we feel like there's some ways some things about how we've done them that we want to share out you know not not uh, assuming that they'll work everywhere um, not assuming that we have all the answers to everything but that's some of what I want to share in the first part of this and then um, the second part of this. Um, looking at how we see the political moment that we're in and how we arrived here into this moment and how that informs how we go out there and knock doors. Our approach to building power in areas like this because of how we understand the moment that we're in and how 
how somebody like Trump could have won an election in 2016. Um, and we want to understand that in order to defeat him in 2020. Oh, it really, really is coming down, huh? So, um, so this is actually a demonstration of a thousand folks. Actually, can you raise your hand if you were at one of the like six hour trainings that we did last summer with PA together? Great, okay, so a few folks, right? So some of this will be a little bit review, but hopefully it won't be the same exact thing. Um, uh, so this is um, uh, a thousand people coming out when uh, what happened in Charlottesville happened. Um, with the white supremacists. And so this was about 18 hours after we called for a demonstration. Um, and so uh, I'm bragging a little bit, but that kind of numbers, a thousand people 18 hours after is just unheard of for Lancaster, right? Um, and that's some of what we've been able to build in Lancaster is this infrastructure to turn out a lot of people and to mobilize both for issues and elections. Um, and we didn't get there from scratch. Um, we did it by, by you know, organizing, um, well, I'll, I'll get into some of it. Um, 10 points if you can spot the Amish man in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> He's right behind the little girl, actually. Um, so I just wanna, there's a lot of things that we could emphasize. I wanna briefly emphasize uh, some of these points. I'm just gonna go through them. Um, for why we feel like it's been been able to have success in Lancaster. Um, the one is building a place for everyday people. And so we, we would estimate that more than three quarters of our base was not involved with politics in any way prior to the 2016 election. Um, it's a mix of working class and middle class people, um, uh, predominantly white in the county, but mixed race in the city. Um, and so we knew right away that most of our folks were not familiar with either being involved with elections or with protests and that we would have to kind of walk people through a, a process to warm up to those things and, to, and oftentimes activism kind of appears as this other identity for people, something that they have to become in order to take action on things that they care about. And we sought to eliminate that. So there were a number of words that we chose not to ever use. We didn't use words like activist or protest um, or even resist. In fact, Lancaster Stands Up was born because we took a poster that was made by the Working Families Party and it had the hashtag resist and we just changed that to be Lancaster Stands Up. Um, and that's how we came up with that name. Um, and the idea is that we we reserve city council's old chambers. We used the town square. We used, we, we called for an emergency community meeting. We made everything look like this is a community response to a moment that we're all feeling and, and made it so that people didn't have to become something else to join it. That as, and it's part of why we have the name of our city and county in the name, right? Um, that folks would feel welcome. and. And we use some, my organization that Alyssa mentioned, Beyond the Choir, a lot of our work has been what we call narrative strategy. And it's like figuring out how to tell stories and find language that resonates with the basis that we wanna move into action. Um, because there's a tendency that happens in every witch group where we start to use language that kind of signals to people who already get it instead of kind of opening a door for people who might have trepidation about taking that first step. Um, training and leadership development has been a really important piece of what we're doing, and, and that's some of what we're systematizing right now. Um, but we did a lot of training and leadership development on um, a number of things, from how to knock doors, to how to give media interviews, to how to have a meeting with your um, elected representative. Um, and you know, part of this is just um, understanding that to build leaders, we constantly, we need a culture where we can be inviting people to learn skills, to learn with each other, to learn from each other, to share best practices, and to, you know, have more opportunities for things to kind of grab them and to, to develop. Um, uh, because when people have a kind of foothold on something that they can do, that feels like it's adding capacity to the group, they're much more likely to stay with the group. And so we've been intentional about that. Um, 
moving the group from resistance to politics, and I know that you all have done quite a bit of this too. Um, you know, in, in, in the end of 2016 and early 2017, it was like one protest after another, just rapid succession. And we kind of recognized that that was gonna wear itself out eventually, and we needed to get ahead of the next wave, which would be energy around the 2018 elections. And that's when a few of us recruited Jess King to run for Congress um, and, um, and came up with a membership model so that we would be able to, as an organization, endorse candidates with some credibility. Um, and so we, you know, we also had to learn a whole bunch of things about like FEC legal compliance and what kind of vehicles you can have to, to do this work more than I ever cared to learn. Um, but we're, you know, we're very careful with all that. Um, but then we also just recognize that over the past 40 years, um, protest and movement work has been over here and electoral work and legislative work has kind of been over here often and there's this chasm between them. This isn't with every group, but it's a big trend where that kind of advocacy work and political work, different people are doing them and there's a chasm in between. And we just think it's so important that the, these pieces of work strengthen each other. Um, that you know our opponents in politics would like nothing more than for us to be totally outside of the realm and not contesting for political power. Um, and we find our issue work is stronger when we've proven that we have some electoral bite, when we have the ability to influence elections. Shocking, people in office listen to us more on the issues. Um, and we find that our issue work is stronger when it's not just like we're just trying to elect people and that's why we're talking about issues. Um, so um, this is kind of an internal term that we use that I'm gonna get into uh, quite a bit for, the, for the, the latter part of the presentation. But we think about what we call inclusionary populism. And so people have often called Trump a populist um, or talked about the populist moment that we're in. Um, and we actually think that the essence of populism being bottom versus top or you know the people versus the corrupt establishment, um, there's a version of that that is actually much more fitting for us and Trump is, is actually a, you know, a fake, a con man using that populist language because he recognizes the moment that we're in and that by using that kind of language in an empty way, he can, he can win. But we actually have to use not the same language as Trump, but I'll get into it a little bit more, but we have to pick fights with power, you know, kind of in the name of the people. Um, and, you know, part of that is economic justice and economic populism. But we also think, you know, this is 2019, we need racial justice and social justice to also be at the center of our vision. Um, and so this is a racial justice training of 200 people in 2017 with our base. Um, and the ways that we do that are, you know, uh, the ways that we center racial justice and economic justice are, are complex and we don't have simple answers, but that's a big thing we're wrestling with is how do we build multiracial power in these areas that are predominantly white but that have urban centers that are majority people of color. Um, and I'd, be, I'd love to talk more in depth about that. I feel like we've made some strides in that, um, even though there's, there's no answer to it. It's, it's like a, it's a thing that we have to be striving toward. Um, we say it's up to us. Right, so we're always pointing at the powerful for naming culpability, but we're putting responsibility on our base. And we're always saying to the people in the room, they're not gonna change unless people like you and me get involved and make them change. And we found that that message works with our base, it works at the door, it's inspiring to people in a way that just blaming the culprits is not, right? Um, and, um, and literally it is up to us, you know, Trump won this, state by 44,292 votes, right? And it's up to us to make up those votes in the next election. It's up to us to hold our electeds accountable, et cetera. Um, so I wanna talk briefly, and this will be a little redundant for those who came uh, to the last one, but just about our understanding about um, how we got here, uh, how we arrived in this political moment, um, because we think it's really important to unite against you know, Trump and against the rise of authoritarian, um, you know, 
white nationalism that, had, that is, is terrifying, right? But we also think we have to take a hard look at how somebody like Trump could want, how this could be happening in order to prevent it, um, including some of the failures of the Democratic Party. Um, if we want to, you know, prevent somebody even worse than Trump coming down the line. Um, so this this is a very short version of a history of how basically the rise of Reaganism. Anyone recognize this guy? Is that Powell? Powell. Well, it was Powell. Yeah. Right. So he became a, a Supreme Court justice soon after this. He's credited with writing um, what's been called the Powell Memo, uh, which is a pretty infamous. Um, thing um, that is basically a call to arms for the right because, you know, up until 1980, the New Deal Coalition had kind of been the hegemonic force in American politics for 40 years. Um, uh, it's not like every problem was solved, right? Certainly not. But a social safety net, um, uh, social security, um, basically a compromise between like the power of capital and the power of organized labor and everyday working people um, that made life a lot more livable and made it so that you know there was a strong working class and or middle class um, in the country. Um, out of Powell's memo um, came the Heritage Foundation, a whole bunch of the organizations that have kind of orchestrated um, the rise of Reaganism and and what we call neoliberal economics. It's debatable how much this memo was a cause of those things as opposed to kind of a, a symptom and something that, but it, it really contains the roadmap. And so part of what happened is the right organized, the right decided that that historic compromise between capital and labor was over, that they were going to try to, to, to take power again. And this worked partly because of, in large part because of racist dog whistle politics. There's a really good book by an author named Ian Haney Lopez called Dog Whistle Politics that lays out this strategy. Um, and here's Lee Atwater um, laying out this strategy that, that basically is saying, you know, okay, we're not gonna use the explicit racist terms that racists have used in the South before. We're going to use these dog whistles. We're gonna refer to busing and um, um, we're going to refer to, um, you know, basically what they did is they they weakened the idea of the public. They made the public look like, um, uh, okay, there's certain people who are taking advantage of the public, and those certain people, right, are black people and brown people. And they used this fear of people taking advantage of, of, uh, well, you can see it in this quote, right? It's kind of a metaphor for anyone know what's happening here? Yeah. After forced integration, um, a lot of pools became private pools and a lot of public pools were just closed down. And it's almost a metaphor for what happened across the country that the, uh, it's a real thing, right? People literally would rather go without this public good, a public pool, than have to share it. Right, or have to, 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 to change the system of white supremacy. And that's what happened with social welfare programs, with um, you know, a lot of public goods, public education being continually weakened during this time happened in large part because of these racist dog whistles. And it broke the kind of solidarity that is needed to, to, to defend against the attacks of Reaganism. And then Reagan, you know, says, this is on his inauguration day, government is not a solution to our problem, government is the problem. It's a funny thing to say on the day that you become the most powerful person in government, right? But what's he doing here? Charlie McCarthy. What's that? It's Charlie McCarthy. Charlie McCarthy? Mm -hmm. Say more. Every time I see his face. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't look like Mortimer, but yeah. Charlie, yeah. What's he doing with this quote, with these words? It's, it's an outside influence that's trying to somehow inflict something on me long term. Right, so we call it third party. He's taking 
how we identification with government, government being a way, you know, of the people, by the people. This is very different than government of the people, by the people, we, uh, uh, of, of the people, by the people, for the people. Um, might have gotten the order wrong there, right? He's instead saying government is this other entity that is, that is trying to, you know, and so he's, he's pointing at the bureaucracy. And when he says this, a lot of people who don't like the New Deal order, right, see themselves in this. A lot of big business people are like, right, government is trying to regulate, you know, you know, is, has given labor an upper hand, it, it's trying to regulate environmental regulations, all these different things I don't want to deal with. A lot of really rich people are saying government is trying to tax me too much. And white supremacists in the South are saying government is forced integration and I don't want that, right? So a lot of different people that made up the, 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 the Reagan coalition see themselves in these words. Uh, importantly, uh, anyone recognize what's happening here? Air traffic control. What happened? Oh, they went on strike and fired. Mm -hmm. Yep, so he fired, was it 11,000 or 13,000 oh. workers? And it was, it, it had a chilling effect on organizing, organized labor in this country. Um, you know, prior to that, there was basically the federal government for a period of decades had had opted to be to try to be neutral in fights between labor and management or labor and capital. And this, the government decided they're throwing down behind the power of capital. Had a chilling effect on strikes, on union organizing generally. So what happens starting around now? The bottom ninety nine percent wealth starts to become stagnant and the top 1% starts to go up. Um, the disconnect on the graph on the left between productivity and worker compensation starts to divide around 1980. And the wealth uh, that is generated starts to go to the 0.1%, the top 1% and hardly at all um, below that. And then racial inequality starts to skyrocket, uh, get even worse again as well, um, especially during the crash. The crash. Um, so, where were the Democrats during this time? Anyone know what's going on here? Stopping crime. This is this is Clinton offering his um, tough on crime legislation, and it's in. Um, I forget the town, it's where the Ku Klux Klan was founded. And just as Reagan announced his campaign in 1976 in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where um, three civil rights um, workers had been murdered intentionally, a lot of people think that Clinton did this intentionally too, to signal um, to the right. Um, so the drug war, right? Welfare to work, welfare reform legislation, um, NAFTA, all these policies, um, and, and so there's a lot of alienation of everyday working people from the Democratic Party, the party that had been the party fighting for them. And what we're not saying here is that there was no difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, but the Democratic Party stopped fighting visibly and vocally for working people. And it was during the same time when everyday people were less involved that big money consolidated its control over the political system and that everyday people started to feel more and more alienated. Um, and so we, we get to what is called a crisis of legitimacy, which it, that's what political scientists call it when um, authority, political authority is seen as illegitimate by a critical mass of the population. <clears throat> and so uh, in my view, a crisis of legitimacy started somewhere in the second half of the George W. Bush administration. The Iraq War being a disaster, uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, increasing um, you know police brutality, the foreclosure crisis. This all culminates right in the 2008-2009 financial meltdown, and that's the first moment. It's kind of like whenever there's a crisis of legitimacy, the people in charge, the political class, is always the last to get the memo, um, and that's the one moment when they realize, oh, we're in trouble when the financial meltdown happens. But what happened since the, the meltdown? They stabilized the economy and they tell themselves a story of a strong recovery and that we're out of the crisis of legitimacy. 
Well, we don't think we're out of the crisis of legitimacy. 80% of the American public has been living in a recession ever since then, right? And um, so that's the moment we're in, is our government doesn't represent us, our economy doesn't benefit us, our society doesn't value us equally. Um, and we got this guy, partly as a result. Um, so the last piece of this that I wanna say is the more solution-oriented piece, and that's how to understand how Trump manipulated this moment to get elected and what we can do to win instead of that. How am I on time? Okay. So this is what we call bottom versus top polarization. We'll get into it in a second. So we think we're really in a battle for the soul of America. And what happens in a crisis of legitimacy is that the political class becomes illegitimate. Nobody wants to listen to them anymore. And so you have these challengers, these outsiders who come around and start to offer a new vision. And you have it both from the left and the right. And how that plays out is so important to determining the direction forward. Um, there was a similar thing that happened in the 1930s, right? Here and in Europe, um, not to terrify anyone, but like, but that's what happened. I mean, people think, that, I mean, FDR barely won and barely was able to do all those things. There was a huge fascist movement in the United States, and there was a huge left in Germany, in Italy, in Spain, um, but the, the, the right wing won uh, in those countries. So there's a lot at stake in a moment like this. It's not neatly exactly like that, but we've seen from the past couple of years the normalization of white nationalism. I mean, stuff that we would not have imagined possible just 10 years ago. And that's because of this kind of moment we're in. So this is where we start getting practical into our approach at the door and how this landed and Lancaster stands up. This is how we are told people are polarized in American society. We've got the left, the right, and the center, right? So we've got the left and the right, the corresponding label is liberal and conservative, and we're told the corresponding parties, Democrat and Republican. So we don't, use this language, or we, we avoid it as much as possible in Lancaster Stands Up when we're not indoors. We try not to invoke it. We try not to even use terms like gun control, which have been labeled along these, these, these lines. Um, and the reason we try to avoid it is because when we talk about issues, one issue at a time, or when we talk about values, we find that people are all over the place. They have complex views. Um, they might be with us on one issue, or against us on another issue, they might be mixed on an issue, right? But when we invoke these labels, people know where they stand. And there's basically four positions. They're either with us, broadly speaking, they're on the left, they identify as liberals or Democrats, or they identify as being on the right, or they identify as being centrists, whatever that means. But that's where they identify, right? Or, and this is the modal response at the door that we found in Lancaster County and in York County, they feel alienated from the whole thing, right? That, that is about 50% of the people that we encounter. So those are the four positions. And when you put these labels in people's faces, they react to them and they try to kind of defend their position. The other reason we don't like this is because it makes people who are self-identified centrists seem like the like adults in the room, like the most reasonable people. They're like, well, there's these extremes here, and these extremists here. We're the ones who speak for the majority. And, and they even project their views as popular. But the most prominent self-identified centrists in our country right now, folks who are writing New York Times columns and whatnot, tend to be apologists for the economic status quo. That's not a popular position at all. That's actually an extreme position in relationship to the American public. So when we don't invoke this, those folks don't have as much to stand on. So you might think, oh, we're not trying to invoke this, so we're avoiding fights, we're not picking fights. That's not true. We do avoid fight, and we do fight, uh, pick fights. Um, and we do it in the way that I kind of talked about before. This is what we call populist rhetoric, or bottom versus top polarization. And this is the simplest version of it. It's the elites or the corrupt establishment at the top versus the people. Trump did a version of this. Bernie Sanders does a version of this. Jess King did a version of this. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez does a version of this. But the version of Trump and those other candidates is, is very, very different. And I just wanna briefly get into 
a little bit of a nerdy presentation, and then we'll open it up um, about how these things are different because it's it's we think it's quite important for us to be able to own this rhetoric um, and to understand how we're doing it and the differences between how we're doing it and how Trump is doing it. So in order to understand it, we ident we introduce a third layer. So we have the tippy top. These are not you know precise sociological categories. Um, but by the tippy top, we're talking about like the 0.1%, like the billionaires, like people with enormous economic power, which over the past 40 years has come to mean political power, right? And then under that, we have what we're calling the cultural elite. And this includes the political class. And here we're talking roughly about the top 10% of the economic spectrum, right? And this is where the leadership of most political organizations is today, both parties, even a lot of nonprofits, even a lot of labor unions. And what's happened over the past 40 years, and then we have the rest of us, right? Um, what's happened over the past 40 years is that there's become a cultural chasm between the top 10 to some people say 20% of the economic spectrum and the bottom 80 to 90%. People live in different zip codes. Um, there's, you know, We've all heard the 1% problem, but there's also this 10% problem, right? Um, and so this is important to understand in terms of how Trump's authoritarian populism plays out, which I'll just show. So there's been this rupture passing. So Trump ran as a populist. We're not gonna watch his video, but you can watch it later. Um, it's actually really worth watching. Um, I don't think the audio is gonna work well enough. I'm a little behind time, but it's kind of incredible. I encourage you to watch it on your own at some point if you can stomach it. Um, but what he does is he kind of obfuscates the economic power at the very top, right? So he invokes it. He's like the global elite, right? And he also shows pictures of like boy blank, blank, fine, blank ship. I forget. But intentionally Jewish people probably. So there's in, in authoritarian populism, there's often a, a anti-Semitic piece in terms of how they punch up an economic power. In Trump propaganda, it's like plausibly deniable, it's dog whistles. Um, but he invokes that, that anger at economic power, but then he never makes it turn into anger at the concentration of wealth and the use of that wealth to influence elections. He just does this big thing to get people angry, and then he channels it into anger at social elitism and at scapegoats, which we're gonna talk more about. So he pretends to punch up by, by punching at the social elitism of upper strata liberals. So his favorite targets, other than the Democratic Party um, leadership, is Hollywood, media, academia, right? And here's why it works. It's really important for us to understand this, um, because a lot of times liberals accidentally play into this narrative, right? It works because um, economic power feels like the weather to people. People are resigned to it. They're especially resigned to it if the Democratic Party or the opposition party isn't naming it as a culprit, which Democrats have been kind of failing to do for decades, right? So it's like the weather, people are resigned to it, and social elitism and condescension have a human face, and it gets people really, really angry. Um, so, you know, the phrase basket of deplorables is a pretty costly example of this in 2016 election. Uh, but there's all sorts of everyday examples in terms of how this plays out. Um, and then, this is important, Trump gained outsider cred by actually picking an open fight with the Republican Party establishment, right? So I interviewed a bunch of Trump supporters. It was fun, it was really interesting. And one after another said that they liked seeing him take out these kind of coordinated candidates, Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio. And so having that open fight within the party gave him this credibility um, and so there's actually something instructive there for us. And then we know Trump really punches down by strategically fomenting prejudice, um, especially Muslims and immigrants, refugees have been his favorite targets. And then he invokes a solidarity, but it's exclusive, right? So a lot of people who feel alienated from American society and from politics would go to his rallies and leave feeling energized, like they're part of something. And so he takes those feelings of community that you might feel being part of this group, right? And you twist them into something that is exclusive, exclusionary. But it's also important for us to recognize that a lot of our opponents get involved not just because of like hate or greed, but because 
they want to be part of something, and that's twisted by Trump. So, Ocasio ran also as a populist. We're not going to watch her video either. We're not going to watch Just King's video. We're just going to end with an understanding of how inclusionary populism works. You see the same structure, but inclusionary populism actually names the economic power at the top. We actually pick the fights with the insurance companies, the pharmaceutical companies, Wall Street, the fossil fuel companies, these forces that have rigged our political system for the interests of the few against the interests of the many. People are hungry for that fight to be picked. And when we pick it, we are able to attract people to our groups and to win people over at the door. Um, we call out the, economic, the, the current leadership of the Democratic Party, not in a burn it all down, blow it all up way, right? Like we recognize that we have a two party system and we have to run people as Democrats and, and become Democratic you know, members, uh, council members, et cetera. But there's a fight that's long overdue that has to be picked with the leadership and over the direction of the Democratic Party. And when there's a crisis of legitimacy where people don't see this upper strata as legitimate, the only way to get to attract people, to attract working people back again, is to pick an open fight for the direction and the leadership of that party. And while Trump's picking up a fight with the Republican Party leadership was just kind of like semantic, like drain the swamp, right? We actually have real grievances that are popular, real reasons to pick a fight with the Democratic Party leadership. And then we call out the divide and conquer strategies of the Republican Party. And I think folks said a little bit about this last time around the canvas. So we essentially, you know, talk about how our opponents are using our differences, whether it's the color of our skin, our country of origin, to divide us. And they're doing that so that they can keep their money in power. And we inoculate people against that argument. And then here's our somewhat tacky rainbow flag. Um, we articulate a we that everyone can be part of, right? Um, and this was embodied in the King campaign in uh, a really strong way. And even though we lost because we became R plus 14 midway through the election, we made up in every single precinct and we made up over 10 points in that race um, by using this approach. In short, it's a them that's small, powerful, and exclusive, and a multiracial working class us. Or we often say Bernie's them, Obama's us. What we mean by that is Obama was really, really good at articulating the vision of we the people from the bottom up, right? So he, he told a, a story of America from the point of view of the suffragettes and the abolitionists and the civil rights workers and people at Stonewall and labor unionists, the people who fought to become part of that we the people. Um, but he wasn't really good, he didn't like to name culprits, right? And that's maybe the Achilles heel of his presidency. It's like he would start out the healthcare fight by making peace with the insurance and healthcare industries instead of naming those culprits, right? Bernie Sanders, on the other hand, right, not actually that great at telling the, the us story. He kind of tacks it on at the end sometimes, like, blacks and Jews and queers are all going to be together. Great. But he was a lot more popular than anyone thought he would be because he was willing to name those culprits that for so long nobody with a microphone was willing to name, right? And so, you know, what's this look like at the door? We don't say things like we need a blue wave. Blue doesn't communicate values. It doesn't communicate anything except for people who already share that assumption. We say things like we need candidates who know who they work for, who stand up to big money and who stand up for all of us. We also don't say like we're pulling the Democratic Party to the left, right? We're like, we're pushing all politicians, Democrats included, to fight for every working people. So that is my presentation that went over.
Yeah, we, we encounter that same thing everywhere. We're active across the state. Uh, raise your hand if you're active with your local Democratic Party in some way. Great, right? So we have people who are doing both, right? It's important. The Democratic Party has a really important role to play, but outside organizations, especially in this moment, have an important role to play too. Um, where I've kind of come to with it is, it is it, that that tension will never go away. We shouldn't even aim for it to go away. We should be principled in the tension, but we shouldn't apologize for bringing in volunteers that the local Democratic Party can't bring in. We shouldn't apologize for being able to reach people that the Democratic Party has failed to reach. Um, and if you know sometimes they lose a volunteer or two to us, well, organize better, right? You know, sorry to be harsh, but um, uh, you know, organizations are responsible for losing their own volunteers. Um, and you know, I say I think I think that I say that as somebody who thinks that the success of the Democratic Party is very very important. Um, but it's like, I mean, I, I and I'm sympathetic to it. You know, I in Lancaster there are people who have worked in the Democratic Party for decades worked against the culture, you know, fought the good fight, kind of held a righteous candle in the, in the wind. And then Trump gets elected and this new organization called Lancaster Stands Up comes along, recruits tons more volunteers than what they could recruit, recruits a better candidate than what they've been able to recruit. And that's like, that's gotta be, I, like I'm sympathetic to how that would feel, right? Um, but we've all gotta like, change with the times. Um, and um, yeah, I, I don't see that problem going away of getting constant pushback of like, why are you doing this separate? Why are you, um, and, and I think we have to constantly reevaluate those relationships, but it's so important to build uh, a strong democratic party. You, you look at the times when we have made the most progress in this country, civil rights le le legislatively, like civil rights legislation, all the civil rights acts, the New Deal, which was a number of legislative packages, right? Those happened when you had Democrats controlling government and you had strong outside independent movements and organizations pushing from the outside. It's always been the combination. In fact, with Obama, we got Democratic control of the, the government, but we had historically weak social movements. And, you know, so I don't even really blame the Obama administration for its shortcomings in terms of the legislative agenda that it didn't pass because you need that combination. You need the groups on the outside making that demand. It's like FDR said, make me do it. But you could have also argued just that people thought we had enough, we got Obama. We don't need those organizations. You know what I mean? We've come so far and that was part of the problem. Right, right. So, and so people assumed we did this, we got this, well, Obama's got this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and part of that's the culture, right? Of forty years at the end of weakening social movements, uh, I think it's really the past three years again, maybe five years, where collective action is becoming kind of in the popular consciousness again. It, this was a decades of like where entrepreneurialism and individualism and had. Uh, so I see two. Why don't we take? Why don't we take a couple at a time? And then, yeah, I think also what has happened the years is that we, when we had progress and we had the media say good things and we had more African Americans in the media and in Hollywood and better jobs in the government, we forgot that the haters are still there and they never went away and they were just simmering and just waiting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we all have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. I would pick up from what was said. See a lot of white faces, not very many people of, of color. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me a seems to be a big problem mm -hmm. from my perspective. Any luck in that in making a nose in that direction in Lancaster? Yeah. Um, yes and it's constant and it's difficult. Um, yeah for sure. Um, so in Lancaster at first our base was around twenty five percent people of color as most of our base was concentrated in the city. Um, and it has gone down as we've expanded into the county. Um, not as in we've lost people, but just we got more white people active. 
So the model that we're trying to kind of, you know, figure out here is how do you build countywide or district-wide political power that's multiracial um, in an area where the cities, like York City, Harrisburg City, and the capital region in PA-10 are majority people of color, but the, the surrounding area is majority white. And that's really a hard thing to figure out how to do because you want participation for people of color and not just like kind of anecdotal or ornamental um, where people are in a white space as individuals. You want the community to have power, to have political power. Um, it's so, Stacey Abrams. What's that? Stacey Abrams has an answer. Yeah, actually she's got amazing stuff on this, yeah. Um, so, but I don't think there are easy answers. I think that this requires, I mean, so where, where we've made the most progress in Lancaster is, you know, our leadership team is, is always at least 50% people of color. Um, our, the leaders that we've chose, that we've invested in, um, we've done so intentionally. Um, the neighborhoods that we've canvassed in, and that complicated, right? Um, but that, the name, and then the issues that we've prioritized working on. So let me give you a quick example of this. Um, Lancaster City is one of the most segregated, racially segregated cities in the country of its size. I think in the top 10, the most racially segregated cities of its size. King Street is kind of like the apartheid street. It's something like 90% of people north of King Street are white and 90% of people south of King Street are people of color. Um, and, as you can imagine, the political power in the city rests mostly in the Northwest Quadrant, um, where more affluent white people are. And you've got organizations in the south part of the city that are religious organizations, service organizations, but you don't have political organizations. And by political, I don't just mean party, I mean organizations that are building political <coughs> power for working people who live there. And so we've canvassed in those neighborhoods, and we've canvassed consistently and intentionally and there was a lot of distrust at first, understandably, you know, and we didn't just send white people there, you know, we had people of color canvassers and white canvassers. Um, and last summer at the height of the King campaign, when everyone knew our primary commitment was the King campaign, we also fought a campaign to stop Geo Group from privatizing the prison reentry services in Lancaster County. And we got a bunch of the community groups together we put work into it and we beat Geo Group. It was a done deal and we reversed it, costing them a half million dollar contract and their first kind of trying to get into Lancaster County. That meant something to people, that we put our time and effort into that fight and that we won that fight. And then uh, within a couple of months, there was a big police brutality incident um, that we mobilized a few hundred people with 24 hours notice and put more pressure on the city on police brutality issues that had ever been the case. And so it's it's in that kind of unfolding reality by being oriented to what are the fights we can pick, what are the things we can do. I think that's how these dynamics are defined, redefined over time. And it's not, it's not easy. I think it's really, really hard. Um, and there's different models. Um, I know like in Berks County, Make the Road organizes Latinx people and Indivisible Berks is more predominantly white and does a lot of support work. That's not really the model we've done in Lancaster, but, um, but there's different groups wrestling with us in different ways. So I would not report to have easy answers, but look, racial, racism and racial identity has been a predominant organizing force in terms of organizing our lives, organizing wealth in this country. And it's thick and it's hard and it's a long-term thing that we have to be serious about about confronting. We do have a case where we have the Susquehanna River. Right, well, right. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest, we have a situation in Cumberland County where the Republican Party puts out signs, dog whistle signs, every election that say, if you love living in Cumberland, vote Republican. And it's just, what do you do with that? How do you fight that dog whistle? I mean, there's signs. Yard signs, like Greg Rothman. Thank Greg Rothman. Yeah, yeah. Greg Rothman. If you love life in Cumberland County, vote Republican. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people see that and don't even realize that. that no, they don't. It's a total dog whistle. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't know exactly. I mean, I don't know your area as well. Um, I do think that 
one of the things that they're doing that that is powerful and instructive on something like us calling this Lancaster stands up right is a contest over what Lancaster means what Lancaster values right somebody could and, and we use signs that say Lancaster values healthcare for all Lancaster welcomes our immigrant and refugee sisters and brothers now you can make the intellectual argument to say eh, Lancaster really doesn't do that right <laughs> Lancaster never has right um, it's similar to claiming America, right? Like, America is for all of us. That was Lancaster Stands Up slogan, and then Jess King uh, stole it, uh, borrowed it. Um, and you could be like, well, America, America is founded on slavery and genocide. America is not for all of us, right? But what we're doing is we're recognizing that the name of your place, Cumberland, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, America, right, has power. It has power because people identify it as part of a we. And so we're saying, this is what Lancaster is about, right? And that's a claim, right? That's a political claim, and it's a contest. And so they're doing it in a way that has racist dog whistles embedded into it because of the whiteness, right? Um, but I think maybe the solution is maybe not exactly like, well, if Cumberland vote Democrat, but, but claiming the name Cumberland and saying what Cumberland is about. And um, boy, it gets under their skin. It really gets under their skin to have a place like Lancaster claimed for as progressive. Um, you know, you can see it by the number of editorials that they have. KGOP has written about us and their FEC complaints. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say that um, it, it seems unlikely that largely white organizations are going to get black participation in particular passages. I think part of the problem is rather than our looking to see if black will participate well, I think we need to reach out to um, African American organizations, to Latino organizations, and that's been really lacking in the area. Um, there is um, a Harris Foundation NAACP is having this meeting in a couple of weeks. I, I just wonder how many people here knew that or were even in the same job. Um, I was at the NAACP meeting a couple of weeks ago and they are, the members are determined to uh, reverse some of the voting trends uh, in the city in the community. But I don't think they can do it alone. I think they're looking for participation. Um, if you want to see where the problem is, Amen. Yeah, we've we've worked closely with our NAACP in Lancaster um, and with some other organizations. Um, I don't see it here though. Yeah. So I mean, it, there's not easy answers. Again, right? Like you're gonna you obviously you want to make your group welcome for people of color, and but also aligning with other organizations that are people of color led. I guess my point was, I don't think we can just sit here and be passive. Yeah, great. So, did you have something on I was gonna say, like, I, I'm a member of Mom's Kids Action, and they're doing a big push for, and I'm just sorry, yeah, the DEI, so diversity, equi diverse, equitable, and inclusive, because if you look at generally the leadership of Mom's Kids Action, it's predominantly white. And it's been an awkward discussion, we watched the video by Seth Max this week, and he talked about it, he's like, if you're sitting in this lecture and you're comfortable, then you're not. Like this is uncomfortable work. Um, so it was interesting. One of the women who was the lead in a group that we were in, we talked about like you have to watch what, and this is what I always hear. And me thinking I know better than someone, I'm the whole white savior garbage. Um, but like she even talked about like finding um, black sororities and like reaching out to them and say, hey, do you need assistance with any events or what are you doing? Any rides or student resistance groups or whatever? Making making connections not even on the issue that's at hand and just seeing what you can do to help out to change that and doing something about it is one One of the things that like you guys had your Lancaster City, you said that's where your group started to grow from and then you moved out and became whiter. Part of our problem here in Cumberland County is we don't have uh, like York, York City, or Dauphin County, Harrisburg, or Lancaster, Lancaster City, you know, we have Carlisle, a white college town, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's really, 
hard for us to, you know, how, how, do, how do we do that? How yeah. do we call hydrophobia? You cross the bridge <laughs> and you join a black organization and you show up. No, I understand. And then you don't tell them what to do, but you see what you can do. No, I am, I'm not, but I'm trying to say, like, if we're talking about like, our count, like, we're, yeah. our geographic area is our county. I'm not saying not to cross over and not to get involved in our county, but what I'm saying is just here within our our county, if we're doing like this county thing, mm -hmm. we have plenty of people of color in that we can reach out to. You know what I mean? Yeah. <coughs> and, and, but it's, it's, it's going to be a different model, I think, needed than what you had because we have like the eastern half of Cumberland County is neighborhoods, suburbs after suburbs, and then we have farmland, you know, like a little bit yep. over. So it's gonna it's gonna have to have a different type of model than what Lancaster and York have. Yep. Um, so I want to take one over here, and then I've got a couple things to to say about my comments. Yeah. I, I was I was only going to comment, Kathleen, that I think one of the best things that this group could do is meet the Harrisburg Young Professionals of Color because they they live, not only do they live in Gotham County, they live in Cumberland County, mm -hmm. and they are a fantastic, wonderful group, and their events are quite public. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's a good way for us to start. So I wanna say a couple things on this. Um, one is that we also have to organize white people and white working class people, and we should make no apologies for that, right? Because part of how Trump won is because progressives have stopped organizing white working class people and have totally ceded that to the right. White working class and white middle class people. So I just wanna be clear as we, this is a both and, right? So we should make, we should make, because I think I've seen groups go too far in the one direction where they're just become, where they just become support groups for people of color led organizations when really they're positioned to politically organize white people along progressive lines, and that is absolutely needed. That's an absolutely needed task. So that's a really important thing, but I think it's both and, right? I think you can do that and play that role while also being in relationship with other organizations and, um, and being, so I have a friend named Max, uh, um, uh, elder or a um, mentor of mine, um, political mentor, Max Elbaum. And um, I asked him this when I first moved back to Lancaster in 2004 or five, six, when I was organizing with the Lancaster Coalition for Peace and Justice. And he gave me this answer around, you know, a similar question that I was wrestling with him on about how to figure out race in the work that we were doing in Lancaster Coalition for Peace and Justice had a lot of people of color, but was overwhelmingly white. Um, and the answer he gave me is that like, think about this like a campaign, like anything else, this becomes mystical to people and it becomes like, oh, like it can become guilt ridden too, like where people just feel like we're doing something wrong. Treat it like a campaign in terms of like, set some goals as an organization. Like uh, maybe your goal for the next year is to have a meaningful, whatever, however you define that relationship with like four people of color led organizations in your area and you define what that meaningful thing is and you set that as a goal for X amount of time, right? And when you have clear goals, then you can, you have clear criteria by which to evaluate whether you're reaching those goals. And in that process, your goals may expand, right? But to have clear goals around how you're going to integrate a racial lens, a racial justice lens into your work. Um, because it's different for every group. And like what you said, it's different for, I mean, actually I think some of our groups are more similar than what you think, because in, in York, we haven't been active in the city at all. This has all been in Southern New York, right? Um, and in fact, some of how we've organized, we have, we're organized by locals now. So we've got, Lancaster stands up as the countywide, but we've got Solanco stands up, Ephrata stands up, all these local groups which most of those are very, very white spaces, right? It's the city group that is racially diverse. Um, so we wrestle with these. I, I, I also don't want to let on at all, like we have this more figured out than anybody else. Um, it's, it's really uh, hard stuff, but those are some of my thoughts.
Okay. okay. All right. One more. One more. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, we are pretty professional, sort of. I don't know, oriented. How is there? Are there tips about? I mean, other than just what language we use to do a better job of reaching working class people in our community. Um, that's a that's a great question. I, I want to address it just from my experience in Lancaster because our initial base was more middle class people um, and we have over time built an organization that is a mix of middle class and working class people and I know those are not, those are categories that are contested and they overlap significantly, right? But we did intentionally expand our base to be more working class than what it was in the offset, in the outset. Um, and a lot of that was training our middle class um, volunteers to in some of this in some of this kind of these scripts because what we found is that people were going to the door with assumptions sometimes from their class background that just ha there was a different relationship with politics than, than and and just things like people would go to the door initially and be like well the Democrats are you know like or people would be like I don't want to have anything to do with politics and people would be like well, you really should, and and kind of be a cheerleader for a candidate or for the party or for political involvement, and it didn't work, right? We a lot of it was training people to kind of meet that alienation that people felt, to um, empathize openly with it, to figure out a part of yourself where you could tell something about yourself that relates, um, and so it, I mean, a lot of it was actually just training and orientation, and intentionally like. The doors that we were knocking intentionally, right? Um, being more because there's one model of of cutting turf in Van that is going after the more affluent suburbs. It's a legitimate political strategy. I think it's important to contest those areas, but there's just as legitimate strategy, and I think important for the long term. Um, it's made as much of a difference in elections for the groups that have gone this route, like in Lancaster, New York, to go after disaffected working class neighborhoods. Um, both white, black, brown, um, across the color line, but including white working class neighborhoods. And so, but I do think it takes some some orientation and, and we'd be happy to do a more in-depth um, thing. And it, a lot of it's doing it and sticking with it, you know? I mean, there's experienced canvases in the room. I think a lot of folks know how to do this. Um, but there are some things that are a little bit different in terms of how we've done it that I think might if I could just add to, you know, this area, even though we look monolithic, maybe, you know, from the outset, like, it's pretty diverse in terms of people's individual experiences and just knocking doors as a candidate. Um, you know, I've had people, like, I met a woman who lives in Camp Hill who's married to a white Republican male who's from West Africa, and she told me about all of the difficulties she's had feeling accepted in the school system with children who have you know, are biracial when in our school system we only pick, give the kids like black or white to choose from and there's not, no mixed race. Um, or like, I think I was telling you, Erin, that I knocked someone's door and I was like, what do you think are some of the issues in Camp Hill? And she's like, well, I think people in Camp Hill think I'm the issue. And you know, I was like, tell me more about that. And she said, well, we're renters and nobody in Camp Hill has any respect for renters. And I just think that there's all these people that when you start, when you go talk to them, like you have these conversations where you realize, and Erin, can you just say about the different boroughs, like the, the story you were telling me? So, um, I, I'm a working middle class um, candidate, and, and when I, what, just briefly, when I'm not working, I'm not getting paid, I am, you know, commission based, but hourly, and um, I don't have time for this, but I've made time for this, and I'm making less money than I've ever made before in my life, so our family is taking a hit on purpose for for the betterment of the borough, potentially. That's the goal, right? But um, so when I sit in meetings, because I am sitting as a vacancy filler since June in Camp Hill, um, I have a different perspective. Um, my fellow councilmen are from different neighborhoods than I. Um, so, and I hear what they're saying and I say, oh, I would like to say, if that's the case, then this could also be the case and just give my point of view because I am coming from a different day. You know, my day is very hectic and I'm trying to maximize my paycheck and I am trying to make meetings and committees and um, meet with people and canvas and I'm trying, and I basically hound Alyssa for information because I don't have time to do it myself. 
um, but they have a little bit less of a day. So when I bring up my point of view, I'm often reacted to with, do you live in a different borough than us? Oh. Or it's as if you live in a different borough than we do. And I laugh and say, I do guys, over and over and over. I live on South 30th. I, I live next to a one car home. Like I, we, you know, we don't have a car payment until recently and it's killing us. So yeah, I live in a different borough. And that is what I'm trying to figure out. Like our socioeconomic diversity is vast in, in Camp Hill Borough, just particularly. Um, and we need that representation, but it's so hard for working class people to do it. We don't have the time. We don't have the flexibility. We don't have the money. So but they canceled a meeting on her without telling her. And, and I had moved my entire schedule around. I could have made enough to pay for my children's voice lessons that day. And I showed up and no one was there because they didn't see the um, value in calling me directly. They posted it to Facebook. They put it on their website. But I showed up. And, and they canceled it within 12 hours. So, anyway, I just wanted, whatever it's going to that. I think we have people we can bring in here yeah. that are not that are not feeling heard or represented, and they're right here, and they're our neighbors. And to empower them, yeah. I've always felt empowered. I thank my father for that, but I know a lot of pe peers uh, economically are not empowered, and they're just tired, you know. So to mirror their feelings and their experiences is powerful when you're going door to door or when you're talking with folks in different organizations. Oh. And that goes for, you know, middle class, people of color, et cetera, et cetera, parents, non-parents, teachers, et cetera, so. Thank you. It's a valuable yeah. skill. I think I'll, I'll end on that note and just reinforce that, you know, I mean, this is, this is essentially what you're saying is, uh, this is what's happened to our politics over the past 40 to 50 years is for for a period of about 40 years before that you had working class people having political vehicles that they built from the ground up importantly labor unions but other organizations too and they had a lot of power not all the power but a lot of power a voice in politics right and over the past 40 years working class people have been alienated disenfranchised, cut off, left behind by the political system. And it's a self-fulfilling thing too, right? Um, I mean, it's interesting, like there is a struggle for time with working people mm -hmm. right now, but also once working people, like people make time for what's important to them, yeah. as you have, yes. right? But part of it is that, you know, people are given the message, like you're not really welcome here anyway. and. This politics isn't serving. There's a common sense among working class people that politics is not serving them, and among poor people even more. That politics is not for them, so why would they bother getting involved? And that translates even down to why even bother voting, right? Um, and so I think that really gets at the heart of what we have to reverse in the work that we do, in the, in the, the, the door knocking that we do, in the power that we build, um, in, in groups like this, and I think in who we intentionally try to recruit or align with in our organization. So, um, great questions. I'm glad that we really got onto the topic of both like race and, and class and, and involvement. Yes, what? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone.